the word had come through that there was a possibility of a drive-by. I remember her screaming and saying, don't hurt him. I remember that. The doctor, as well as the chef, were all in this together, and they, they worked very hard to cover it up. In the years leading up to the Civil Rights era, when segregation was the social order of the South, acts of racial violence were widespread, including murder. Law enforcement turned a blind eye, and the courts usually did nothing. Killers went free, while the victims' families had little choice but to suffer their pain in silence. At Northeastern University School of Law, the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project seeks to keep these crimes from fading into history. The project examines how the legal system failed the victims of racial violence then and pursues remedies now, decades after the crimes were committed. The Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Clinic operates like a law firm. Our cases are cold cases. We work to develop the cases and to obtain some measure of justice for those communities that were affected. We're now working with a period of uh, American history that has really not been adequately explored. The persons who have knowledge about these events, the family members, the witnesses, are aging. The documents are disappearing. And if we don't do this now, this piece of our history will be lost to us and to future generations. In April 1953, in Wilcox County, Alabama, Sheriff Lummy Jenkins and two deputies invaded the cafe operated by 63-year-old Della McDuffie and her husband, William. The lawmen claimed they were playing music after midnight on the Sabbath. Although Della McDuffie was paralyzed and in a wheelchair, Sheriff Jenkins beat her with a rubber hose, and within an hour, she was dead. So he walked in and hit her, told her, get up, old lady, and go to bed. So she told him she couldn't get up. So he hit her across her arm on her knees. Then he hit her in the head. And he shot down by her feet a couple of times. And that's it. Mm -hmm. I went down to Alabama to conduct some research on the Della McDuffie case. I dug up the file from Thurgood Marshall to the current head of the Department of Justice asking for him to look into the McDuffie case. But at the time of Della McDuffie's murder, Marshall was working on the case of Brown versus the Board of Education, which the Supreme Court decided in 1954. The McDuffie case did not get enough attention from the NAACP, and the Justice Department refused to prosecute the sheriff. So I retrieved the FBI file related to the case from the National Archives. I received the citation for it. I saw a lot of affidavits with witness testimony, including people who were in the cafe that evening, the undertaker, the doctor, Sheriff Lemmy Jenkins, and Ella McDuffie's husband and son. William McDuffie gave a statement to the FBI. I could see him striking at one person, then another with the hose lag weapon. I saw a number hit with the weapon in Sheriff Jenkins' hand. But Dr. Robert E. Dixon's statement reads, I can definitely state that the cause of death was not brought on by any injury to the head, such as a blow. This case essentially was a cover-up, and it never went to court. A year into the investigation, her husband William was found dead by his two grandchildren. I found my grandfather, and it appeared that he had been killed by, by way of drowning. They killed him because of the intensity of this investigation. They tried to get him to change his mind. 
happened and changed his statements like everyone else did. He refused to do that. Uh, and he took care of it. There was house fires. Our house was burned down two times. There had been other threats. This man came to the door and he said, you need to get your family and leave here. He said, they are going to kill you. And we left in the middle of the night. They left the house completely furnished, cars, everything was intact. We left just like that. For 32 years, Wilcox County, which was largely black, was Sheriff Lummy Jenkins' personal empire. He gained notoriety for playing by his own rules, legal or not. Lummy Jenkins was known for the way he, he enforced law here in Wilcox County. And, uh, and he did it with an iron hand. They followed their own rules, not so much what the law said. Uh, it was tough on, on certain people, especially black folks. Lummy was a, a good sheriff, but uh, somebody else may have a different penny, opinion. The McDuffie story is, in fact, it's a story of violence. It's a story of secrecy. Uh, it's a story of banishment. This repeated silencing is a large part of uh, what we try to address in our project. My father was Malcolm Wright, and he was a sharecropper. In July 1949, in Chickasaw County, Mississippi, Malcolm Wright, his wife, and children were riding in a mule-drawn wagon heading into town on a Saturday morning when three men in the car yelled that he should stop hogging the road. And we were just riding along, doing our normal, singing our songs. And um, I remember a black car approached us, and they turned around and came back. And then they took a object from the trunk of the car. As a child, I thought it was a, a crowbar. His own, his own sad. This is where Malcolm died at, where they pulled over the wagon, right here. It's day like today. They had to hit him in the head with a with a with a car jack, so they told me. And they beat his brains out there in the road. So at the beginning I just had a, a article that just mentioned that Malcolm Wright was killed in Houston, Mississippi. I researched online and found various news articles from the 1940s, 1950s. The Historical Genealogical Society, they also had various articles on Malcolm Wright. In the Malcolm Wright case, our student found every single one of the living sons and daughters of Malcolm Wright, brought this story back to them, no one had ever talked to the right children about what happened to them. James Moore went on trial for his life in the Bumper Jack murder of Malcolm Wright. Named in the original indictment were James Red Kellum and Eunice Gore. My older sister and Henry, they allowed them and my mom to testify, but they didn't allow the three younger children to testify. When Henry got ready to testify, the judge told him, you make sure you tell the truth <laughs> and, and you refer to me as Mr. The all-white jury found James Moore not guilty. Kellum and Gore were never tried. All three walked away free. 
and the Wright family had to move out of Mississippi. This is a case in which you have the appearance, but not the reality, of any real justice. We've tried again in this case to get the county to acknowledge that something went wrong here and that it's the duty and the responsibility of the county to make it right. And we've been told, no, that can't happen because uh, the perpetrators still live and work in this town. The, the brother of the perpetrator became the mayor of the town and was the mayor for many years. My statement is, if we've already closed it, you start the healing process, a wound. You've got another wound that you're wanting to reopen. Reopening a wound, it takes longer to heal. And that's kind of, that's the way I look at it. We was all in, having fun, playing music, and this particular record came on. And my cousin said, do you want to dance? We heard a lot, loud noise. All of a sudden, he turned my hand loose and fell to the floor. And I heard people saying, you just killed that boy. And I looked down on the floor and he was laying down there. October 1955, Mayflower, Texas. Two men, Perry Dean Ross and Joe Simpson, went on a drive-by shooting rampage through the black part of town and fired nine shots into a cafe. Came on down the road and shot in the school bus when my dad drove in the car, our car, and came on up May Mayflower, you know, shooting. I was hit in the cafe by a bullet, and my sister was too. From what I heard, there was anger from the white community uh, considering uh, schools being built for uh, black kids. I was a law student at Northeastern University School of Law when I started investigating the John Earl Reese case. I got a first-hand look at how deeply this impacted a community and how deeply this incident impacted people. And they were not just impacted by the murder and the shooting of the street and the shooting up of the school, but they were also deeply impacted by the way that that history was erased. I went to the Gregg County Courthouse and looked through records. I found John Earl Reese's death certificate, which indicated that he died from an accident. I spent time figuring out how to get that death certificate changed and making sure that it actually got changed. And I found that Ross, one of the perpetrators, was convicted of murder, but then did not serve any time. He was given a five-year suspended sentence, but not a day in jail. What's particularly remarkable was the platform for restorative justice that Kaylee, working along with that community, was able to build. I helped the community to raise money to obtain a civil rights marker. We also had a street sign named John Earl Reese Road, which is actually on the street where he grew up. My research was collected and put in a binder in the Tatum Library so that younger generations could come to the library and learn about the history of John Earl Reese. Finally, Kaylee Simon helped to plan an all-day event to celebrate the life of John Earl Reese. Hundreds of family and friends attended. The gravestone was unveiled. The civil rights marker was revealed. The street sign dedicated. A painting commemorating John Earl Reese was presented and at the Tatum Library, a plaque dedicated. Speeches were made, and finally, everyone sat down for a meal together at the community church. And we were so proud to participate in the John Earl Reese Memorial. It was a wonderful event, well attended, and everyone there walked away with a, a blessing in their heart. After so many, many years, even as time went by and everything, that soon it was time for justice. 
something happened in this community, and it was important enough that we came together, and there is a marker. And then just across the road there is John Earl's Lane. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The CRRJ Clinic is really at the heart of Northeastern's unique approach to legal education, which is that students learn not only from books, but they learn by doing. I feel so lucky as a law student to have come down here and to be welcomed by this community. And I wanna make it my life's work to make sure that this is never forgotten.